right, so I have the, the sad honor of being the last talk of uh, the conference. Um, and I want to do, um, uh, take advantage of the typical 20 seconds for thanking the organizers for having the talk, which I do as well, of course, um, and to thank them both for uh, uh, the selection of the venue and the selection of the talks and the posters, I think has been uh, an excellent meeting. I personally have learned a lot, uh, being an observational uh, cosmologist, uh, I took away a lot of, of good things and, and the acquaintances from this meeting. So, uh, that being said, I'm uh, not sure for all, uh, let's see if this works. Uh, okay, so from the Mali, which is a, a highly physics uh, institute, and today I'll be uh, devoting uh, some time to talk about uh, galaxy clustering systematics in, in photometric survey, uh, surveys. So I think uh, galaxy clustering has been, by itself has not uh, uh, been the subject of a lot of talks, I think. So I think it's, uh, it fits into to include this. Um, by the way, I, what the, the depiction, this is a depiction from the deep learning model DALI of what the galaxy clustering systematics look like. So it would be really awesome that it looked like this and we have to prove it out. Anyway, so uh, this is just like a um, sort of a reminder of um, um, of that uh, the cluster is a major component of uh, current cosmology analysis, both historically and currently. So um, it is very important. Uh, it has been historically very important to have uh, accurate uh, measurements of uh, of the of the clustering of galaxies because it has been, in some sense. First step towards uh, the current era of precision cosmology because it would have provided this uh, first numerical assessment of the logical structure of the universe. So currently, the angular correlation function, which is uh, sort of an, uh, is, uh, is uh, an estimate of that function, is uh, can be used today to aid in the determination of more uh, of uh, uh, precise uh, cosmological uh, precision cosmological uh, parameters in combination, for instance, with it's here, with CMB, as we said before, and also determined the BAO. By itself, it doesn't have uh, much of uh, uh, intrinsic, uh, uh, intrinsic power, uh, but um, given that it's a core pillar of uh, the, a core pillar of all these combination measurements, uh, today what we're going to talk about is essentially what are the observational effects that can modulate the signal and result in shifts in the uh, SA domain M parameter, and how do we correct for them? So, um, just a, as a brief reminder, the angular correlation function is essentially an estimate of how uh, the projected um, cosmic web um, uh, or a measure of the aggregation of galaxies through a statistical estimate. Okay. <coughs> so, this I'm um, going to talk about in the context of the dark energy survey, which is mainly um, the project that I've been working on, the, have been working on in the last. Uh, 10, 50 years, um, and the um, dark energy survey essentially is a photometric survey that is doing a one one arc second resolution map of 5,000 square degrees in the sky. So we're taking pictures of the sky, and we're reaching depths of up to uh, magnitude i of 24. And in combination with this photometric lens that I listed here, from optical to to infrared, this essentially just to give you an idea. This essentially translates into a ratio for and um, one thing that I want to make very clear is that the redshifts that we obtain, as uh, we mentioned uh, in several talks already, are photometric redshifts. So we have a relatively poor determination of what is the depth or the, the, of the actual distances of these galaxies. But of course, the fact that we're taking pictures allow us to combine them with the shape, uh, measurements of the shapes and with cosmic shears. So that's one of the advantages as well of doing this kind of survey. Um, uh, originally, the dark energy survey, well, its idea was to explore dark energy use these uh, different probes. By the way, watch out for the next uh, couple of months. Uh, we're going uh, uh, to publish the first, or the final, I should say, Supernova 1A uh, cosmology results. But I'm going to focus today on the combination of weak lensing and clustering. And then, by the way, this is the camera of the dark energy survey. Take a look at this. There's several CCDs here. Uh, 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 laid out in a hexagonal, uh, hexagonal shape because it is going to be relevant, which I will later. Oops. Let's see. Okay. Let's go. Okay. 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 
hour today. It is uh, already uh, tired. Uh, can I uh, advance with them? All right, so uh, for a brief summary, um, Marika already told us about this uh, yesterday, um, uh, but uh, what we're going to do is, in addition to looking at weak lensing, so uh, looking at uh, the parameter inference by uh, analyzing the coherent distortions of the light, uh, of, the, of the shapes of the galaxies, because of the foreground galaxy distribution, we want to add to the analysis the galaxy distribution itself, so looking, making estimates of how that foreground looks like by using tracers of that, uh, of that foreground. Um, and this has the additional, brings of course its own systematics, as I will comment now, but it has the, the benefit, it has the benefit of constraining in the omega m sigma 8 uh, plane, has the benefit of constraining things um, a little bit tighter in the omega m plane, because clustering provides that. So this is like the final results. I'm starting to talk with, uh, with the results first. And essentially, the, the ideas in year three, the, our main conclusion was that these results are in some compatible, uh, there's some this statistical uh, prior, let's say, with the planned conferred cosmological parameters. Um, modulo this, of course, is using uh, um, uh, tension. So by the way, uh, just a uh, brief reminder, that these, all these catalogs of photos, these are available at this, uh, at this site, at this, um, Web page and then BS year six will double the depth and introduce refinements and model in the systematic treatments and um, the visual will be up the next year. All this uh, more as you know, but that plot. I added another plot here. But maybe it's, uh, I'm not sure it's uh, uh, the, the one that is uh, most fair for the kids people. I, I think I did not. This, this one is from the HSC. And the kids' data I think here does not include the, the clustering, so it's actually much tighter than what is shown here. But essentially, I just wanted to highlight uh, with this plot what is what what it, what all this is about. Of course, this is the 1.7 to sigma uh, tension that and here is the, the, are the main surveys on the latest results from the both HSC kids 1000 and BS year three. So the current observational picture is one is this high value observation of light are consistent. But the three different surveys with different techniques show reported a slight decrease in one discrepancy. There's a lot of literature with the statistical effects of this might come from volume effects as uh, the author was today, um, but I'm not going to get into that. But I wanted to mention that many astrophysical effects that we have been really seeing today uh, from, from the halo mass function, or possibly from, you know, from cosmic shear, from uh, um, uh, so electricity from intrinsic alignments, uh, from the nonlinear clustering, the clustering side, all these astrophysical effects can amount from 0.5 sigma. So what is the contribution of observational systematics uh, on clustering? And can they affect um, the, oh, okay. can they affect the uh, uh, essentially uh, this uh, can they move around a little bit this uh, this contours here? So how am I doing in time? Do you have a So I'm going to So I think I'm going to stand around here. Okay, so what we want to measure is this, as I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, so it's the, the estimate of the algorithm correlation function. This is uh, uh, the, the theoretical um, uh, the theoretical estimation of that what we produce in, the, in, in real space, we saw before in, in, uh, in CL space uh, in, uh, in the previous talk. But essentially, uh, the observational part that uh, can introduce the systematics comes, on the one hand, from the actual estimation from the data, and that is, effects that we move or add clustering power, so that when we introduce uh, that, in conjunction with this theoretical estimate in our likelihood is going to actually be biased in terms of one side or the other in, the, in our final results. And in addition, in the theoretical estimate, we also have to assign um, a distribution of redshifts for those galaxies that we're considering their, uh, their correlation, their estimating their correlation function. So uh, the kind of errors that can modify that are in, uh, starting with photometric redshifts, as we've seen before, on one hand, we have incorrect data assignment 
and also we have we have an inaccurate wretched distribution um, of, of the of the wretches themselves. So what we have here's a simplified version. We are actually not really obtaining a kind of first approximation the distribution of the wretches of those galaxies, and maybe something slightly shifted, and that's or or, or even the distribution may even be stretched or have a little different shape. So those kind of modifications of, from what we're actually observing, it, we introduce them in our MCMC estimation as Lucy's parameters. Okay, so this is essentially what is going to go. We will observe this, and here, for instance, in this example, we are going to introduce um, a relative shift using this effect. And on the other hand, as I said, there are effects that can modulate essentially your estimation of the cluster. Okay, so so quickly because I already already mentioned this as well. Um, one way that we can do this uh, estimation is to use several approaches to the estimation of the LMC. This is one example for a specific recipe. So we, we can have estimates from spectroscopic samples, in the case of vipers, which uh, which will be taken from the same sample that uh, that we're um, doing the. Uh, Spectra from a sample which is identical to the one that we're using for our cross biological effects. And then we can use estimates from uh, photometric resin flows, for instance, in Kemat. We developed, on the extent they developed um, a code to, to, uh, to uh, estimate using the colors and magnitudes of galaxies. And essentially, we cross validate these distributions among them and then uh, compare, for instance, with uh, pro using cross correlations with an external spectroscopic resin sample. Uh, we can more or less correct or shift the, this distribution to provide the final, um, let's say, that the final contribution to this estimate over here on the top. There has been later uh, a few refinements of that measurement using a little bit more sophisticated techniques, which I don't, I don't have time to go into, like the so-called ZombieZ, which is a machine learning method. Uh, that can, but I wanted, I wanted to highlight that, for instance, in this little um, uh, increment in accuracy in our uh, wretched distributions when we count already a few small shifts of the other half, uh, half a sigma. So already we, we have there um, uh, some contribution, uh, systematic contribution possibly. So, and, and in order to remove, <coughs> excuse me, in order to remove the systematic effects on, on the clustering, um, we can, what we can do is, uh, we, we can imagine there can be plenty of observational effects that are throughout our survey, by the way, that's uh, the footprint of the survey in the sky, that can be modulating our signal, right? So this is the a general way that we can, we can put that mathematically. Uh, it um, could be kind of simplifying because we only had linear effects. So the, the observational uh, distribution of galaxies that you can see there in Italy here actually will be made up of true galaxies, a distribution of true galaxies, plus a contribution from several maps that we can uh, priorly, uh, previously uh, map out, but can, that can be uh, having a contribution to that, uh, to that uh, final observed um, galaxy distribution. So um, this, in terms of correlation functions, can be very easily uh, demonstrated by uh, something like this. We will do, uh, do cross correlations of the systematic maps that we uh, created previously in order to, to correct for this effect. Also, the, the other effects that are not modulating multiplicative, multiplicatively the galaxy distribution, that could be an additive effect, for instance, for galaxies uh, or, or objects that are uh, adding to power to our um, uh, survey, for instance, the presence of stars. Which are not modulating that, but actually adding an additional contribution, so an additive effect that will start complicating a little bit the, uh, the correction. And as I decide, um, how do we actually go about building all those maps? Well, uh, that's uh, things where it start getting a little bit nitty gritty, but essentially, we, um, each of these uh, surveys actually is not a single path through the sky, but actually is made up with a lot of overlapping images. You can imagine that, the, for instance, these maps, uh, to give you an example, the, the air mass of the, that is how, how much uh, the, the inclination over the, over the horizon of the sky, that the, the point of measurement can be the scene, can be the sky brightness, all that can modify the actual detection of galaxies, 
right? So how do you implement those maps given that at a specific point of the sky you have gone through that, uh, uh, on that position very a lot of times with your survey? Well, actually, you have to build a very complicated and complex map of superpositions of all the CCDs and then assign or measure what was the seeing the air mass sky brightness at that point at that time and then uh, the final map will be built uh, using some sort of statistic for that uh, position uh, for instance the mean, the median, the maximum, the minimum and all that will um, uh, contribute to the, your pool of systematic maps that then you will correct for Okay, there's just a list that I'm not going to go through, but uh, I gave you some examples before. So what is actually the mitigation strategies? So one of them, well, you can just forget about <laughs> uh, including those effects. But that means actually identifying where those effects are more egregious and just eliminating those directly from the survey. That's the, the first thing you will think about. So essentially masking the survey. But of course, in this case, you will lose a lot of real estate of actually uh, interesting um, uh, power of uh, uh, for your uh, statistical power, of course. Then you can do uh, corrections, which essentially would be uh, detracting or removing um, this. Uh, by the way, this can be estimating using uh, cross correlations of systematics with the, the those systematic maps can be cross correlated with the with the galaxy maps. And then there's a, a little formula that you can include that uh, emulates this this correction. And then finally, instead of going uh, through the route of the data, the correct, correcting this data vector, this uh, estimation, we can go directly and try to include weights in the galaxies themselves. So before computing the angular correlation function, we would add some weight that would consider the specific point in the sky. Depending on the amount of systematics that you have in that specific point in the sky, you will upweight or downweight that galaxy. Okay, to, to try to compensate, you can do build that, for instance, as a function of a certain um, a systematic. You can try to build what is the relationship of the, of the galaxy density as a function of that systematic. It doesn't have anything to do with density, right? So those weights, you can compute them from this sort of linear relationships. The, the original one is the red. And after applying the weights, you calculate against the cross -border, this, this relationship, which is here that is flat. And you obtain things like this, where the original measurement of the angular correlation function, this is already final real data from the ES, the original correlation function is now weighted uh, towards this uh, final value over here. Sorry because it's blinking, it was uh, almost out of battery. Um, or, okay. Uh, yes, I just wanted to give you a, uh, okay, yes. This is a, so the idea is that um, uh, how, how would you go about um, selecting those maps? This is an alternative process. So first, you would select the one that is the, has the most significant cross correlation with your observed signal. You would correct for that one. Uh, the others will have also some sort of uh, significance. And then uh, everything, this is a, was an awesome movie, a lot of uh, animation. Um, and and every, all these correlations will actually go down, but there will still be some uh, other correlations uh, that will be over the, our preset thresholds. We would uh, recalculate the weights for that uh, specific map. map. So as you see, it's an iterative process that eventually will lead to all the galaxy, I'm sorry, all the maps being under that the threshold of significance that we, we said previously. Okay. Um. And essentially, the final word here is that the kind, this kind of um, uh, errors, or this uncorrected uh, systematics, if we don't take care of them, we're talking about two sigma shifts uh, with the current uh, with, with the current data sets um, in, in the parameters of uh, sigma and omega. Here, you can only see one sigma because this, uh, well, I only have a plot here for one. Um, by the way, it's sigma, not SA, but I, I check that the SA is more than SA. Uh, this is only one sigma because for data in year one, data for year two, I'm oh, sorry, year three, uh, the, the actual shifts and parameters are is of the order of two sigma. So this is an absolutely necessary change. Uh, and for, for instance, for primordial non-oceanities, it's an absolute game changer. I mean, you have to do this very well too, because all the signals in the power of large, large scales. 
So um, I just wanted to highlight that other tests were done. Uh, there are many other ways of, of checking this. You can use, you can imagine using machine learning to try to um, learn what is the relationship of, ga of the density of galaxies with the systematic effects, and then correct or, or even compute the weights from that. You can use machine learning as well, I think, as kids did, to instead of uh, computing weights, computing randoms, which is used for the estimators. So there's a uh, really uh, a plethora of uh, sorry for this of different uh, methods, and this is a really uh, uh, a field which is emerging right now in the last few, like, four or five years because for the first time the, the statistical error is shrinking and we're starting to see this. This is why a lot of these methodologies have uh, arisen. Then we have time to, to go through this slide plus. And this is a bit of uh, unsolicited uh, advice for the future. I just put that there and these are all the kind of tests that we did in DS. Um, there's some, some checks that we did and we, that we came up after blind, unblinding, unfortunately, in some cases that uh, I think are going to be very useful for, uh, for the future for analysis. Okay, and just uh, this is uh, almost the last slide. I just wanted to mention that there's one new thing that we have to take into account in the future, which is blending. It's going to affect especially the, the small scales. And uh, this is going to be uh, have a very, very large impact in the better urban observatory measurements. So stay tuned for that because that's going to be the next uh, the next big thing in this in this field. So I think uh, I changed. I had a, a AI image here as well, but I think that I can't kind of serve as much with my screen. So that's all I have. Thank you.